So I'll do an intro then. Good evening, everybody. I'll do an intro now <clears throat> and then I'll hand over to Pete and I will vamp a little bit first so that those who are um, arriving late because Zoom is letting them in late um, don't miss too much. So this evening we have uh, the third in our current series of talks in the new series from BCS Bristol, hopefully soon to be BCS Bristol and Bath. And we have Pete King, who's a uh, veteran seasoned project manager from Hewlett Packard Enterprise, which is where I work. I've worked with Pete on and off um, a few times over the past 12 or so years. And I'll, I'll, I'll leave that there for comic effect. Uh, <clears throat> so Pete will talk to us tonight about project management. If you do have any questions, then stick them in the Q&A or the chat window, whichever one is working. And I will um, have a look at those at the end. So we'll do about 45 minutes or so and then we'll have a Q&A session, but please do add your chats in um, as you think of questions. So I'll go on mute now and I will cut off my video and over to Pete. Thank you, Dave. Good evening all. Thank you for turning up and spending your time listening to me rambling on. So the talk tonight for me is project management, a pragmatic view. So the question is, of course, he said, switching off his laser, one second. Hmm. Hmm. Excuse me a moment, I switched it there. There we go. So basically, who am I and why should you bother listening to me? At the end of the day, it was basically I started off years ago than I care to remember. I've spent time as a debt engineer, I've spent time as a deal pursuit project manager, I've spent time as a product manager or a product delivery product manager. So basically, I've got about 37 years of probably useful experience in battle scars to share. So the objective of this session, bottom one is the most important, it's not an attempt to turn you into project managers. It's an attempt to try and communicate the project manager mindset and how we project managers operate. It's also going to cover the terms that project managers use and what they mean to you. And by you, I mean, I'm assuming all you guys are members of my current project team. It's to provide you with an understanding how projects work in the real world, because you can read the books, you can do the, the theory and nothing ever pans out that way. And the last section is probably to provide you with some tips and tricks to help you be successful when you're working on a project. So the objective really is that you go away from this with something useful you can use in either your real life or your professional life. So starting off with the basics, what's a project? Depends where you look. If you look at the Cambridge Dictionary, it tells you it's this. PMI, which is the organization that provides my professional certification, tells you it's that. And Wikipedia, everybody's favorite, tells you it's that. The key things about projects is it's a piece of work or a body of work. Ooh, very slow. It's a bunch of work that happens over a period of time and is intended to achieve a particular purpose. That's what all these definitions have in common. From my perspective as a project manager, basically it's something that combines a market need, i.e. someone out there wants to buy something if you give it to them. as a business investment, so the business will provide you with the bodies and the money that you need to deliver, deliver a product to meet that market need. And as a result, revenue will be created, the business will make money. So that's my definition of a project. So why do you need project managers? Obvious question. Let's assume we start off, because this is a British Computer Society, we got a piece of software to design. So we get a bunch of software engineers who are gonna write code. Great. What code are they gonna write? For that, you need marketing. They have to tell you what, what will sell. So if you write this software and deliver it to the marketplace, then someone will buy it. The thing about software is it runs on hardware. So somebody sooner or later has to either define the hardware, build the hardware, buy the hardware, whatever it takes. So you write the software that runs on the hardware. Now you've got to prove it works as a product. So you have to test it in the kind of environment it's really going to face in the outside world. Now you have one piece of something that works. You've got to make more. So that's where manufacturing come in. That can be as simple as putting a website for people to download. It could be make an actual physical product. So you set up the manufacturing process, start churning them out. Now you have a warehouse for the product, great. The only trouble with that is nobody knows how to use it. So for that, you need documentation. That's the install guide, the user guide, the service manual, all the stuff that tells you how to use it. Once you've got that, 
then you need someone to sell it to the customer. You need a sales force. So now you've gone from twinkling in the eye of marketing to a product in the hands of a customer. Where's my laser gone? There we go. Product in the hand of a customer. Customer is happy up to the point where it doesn't work. Then you need support who basically fix it when it's broke. And that's eight different disciplines here, different sets of people with different processes working at different points in time that need to create, come together to deliver the twinkle in the eye of marketing to the customer. And that basically is why you need project managers. So the project manager basically coordinates all these different things happening together. So I don't get to choose the musicians, I don't play the instruments and I don't get to generally don't get to pick the music. But what I do get to do is make sure all the elements come together and make music rather than just noise. So fundamentally, that's what project managers do. So why should you care about project management? Again, I'm assuming you're, I'm talking to you as though you're a project team. Fundamentally, projects are how a business gets things done. It's all organized as projects. So you will work on projects. You work in industry, you're gonna work on a project. Even if you're the lucky person who doesn't, you'll come into projects that happen around you. Project managers, as I said, manage projects. So project managers are gonna turn up on your door and ask you to do things. And if I do that, I have certain expectations of what you will provide to me and you have certain expectations of me. I will chase for progress. As I say, my job is to make sure things happen in the sequence that are intended to happen. So I will chase to get progress. The point of this session is that if you know what a project manager asks, is going to ask you, and if you understand why they're asking that question, your life will be a lot easier. And that's the objective of this exercise. The project world has basically got four elements. First is money. The reason for that is because it has to look at the two rules of business. And there are only two rules. One is make money, because if you don't, you're not a business. Two is keep on making money, because if you don't do that, you're not going to be a business for long. So project managers are always thinking about money. The next thing that project managers spend their time thinking about is time. The reason for that is because I've already mentioned that project is a business investment. The longer the project lasts, the more it costs. So time equals money. I talked about scope. So basically scope is the third element of what I care about. Scope is a list of things that will sell. So as long as you deliver the scope, then a customer's gonna buy it, you're gonna get paid back again, through the time back up to money. One second. Good way, there we go, that's my laser. Quality. Quality is one of these things that could probably be a session in its, in, in its own right. But from a project manager point of view, what quality means is this is the scope you were to deliver, this is what you've delivered. It's a very simple view of the world, but it's a very powerful one as I'll go on to describe, describe and uh, demonstrate later. So the project manager view of the world has four main elements. Look at these elements individually, money. It's all about the money. Why is it all about the money? It's because projects cost money to run. And until the project completes, the business, does, business can't get money back from the customer because customers don't pay until the project is completed. Project managers, me, I get measured by how well I turn a project from the cost to the business to the revenue the products make. Project managers are strictly coin operated. That's what we do, that's what we're about. Second element we talked about is time. I fixate on time a lot as a project manager. Here's the reason why, because time is money. Project teams cost money. They're an investment by the business and the longer they're in place, the more it costs the business. We look at that as a sort of a naughty example. You work for a company, you get paid by the company. That's all it costs the company to, to employ you, right? Not quite. What you've got to look at from a project manager point of view is the fully loaded cost per person. So that's comprised of a number of different things. So for example, the salary you get paid, that's one element of fully loaded cost. Company pays national insurance on your behalf. That's a cost to the company that gets factored in that you don't see, but the company has to pay. Pensions, stuff like that, all to do with the money the company pays out in order to keep you employed. Then we've got equipment. I'm talking to you from my company laptop, for example. You guys, be software developers or otherwise, will have workstations, laptops, potentially phones, all the stuff you need to do your job. And that's local to you. External to you, you got email systems, you got build systems, you get everything else that's needed in order to do the job. That's the equipment that's required. Then we can look at facilities. 
In the days when we always used to work in offices, you had to have an office with a desk. That desk had tea and toilet facilities, it had air conditioning, it had lights, all the stuff that was necessary just to give you a place to do your job. And then when you get to big companies like HP that I work for, there's a whole load of ancillary stuff. There's people like HR, like finance, like accounting, all those sort of things. There's numerous vice presidents, presidents, directors, all these sort of guys who are not directly related to the delivery of the project, but are necessary to keep the business in the air. Those costs get distributed amongst, amongst all the various people. That's what's called the fully loaded cost. Now, $50, isn't, $50 an hour is actually a low fully loaded cost. I won't tell you what it costs on HP because I don't actually know. But if we take 50 as an example, that turns into $350 a day, $1,700 a week, $85,000 a year for every person just to be employed and working on a project. Typical project, 12 to 20 people. Assume it's 12, that's a million dollars a year for a project just to keep the project staffed and doing what it's supposed to do. The reason why I'm fixated about time is because projects are like taxis. Even if they're not moving, the fare keeps on clocking up. So it costs a million dollars a year to keep those, that project team of 12 going, whether they're actually producing something useful or sitting on their hands. So project managers are there with pointy stick to keep the project moving along. One of the things, objectives of this exercise was to talk about terminology, because the thing about, I guess, the difference between developers and project managers, is we tend to use the same words, but mean different things. And that leads to all manner of chaos. So two terms you hear bandied around almost interchangeably as a plan and a schedule. So in my world, my project manager view, what's a plan? Basically, it's a chronological list of the things you need to do in the order you need to do them. No more than that. So therefore, what's the schedule? It's a plan with dates. Projects run to schedules, not plans. And that's something that's often causes a lot of stress and tension between the developers and the project manager, because developers tend to work from here to there until they're done, whereas project managers actually start at the end and work backwards to make sure it can fit in the hole that's available. So as long as you remember when you're working on a project, the project manager is thinking about a schedule that will keep you in good stead. An important aspect of this is who defines and agrees and owns the schedule, because this is another place where developers and project managers often fall out, because there's an expectation from a project team that once they've defined a schedule, the project manager owns it. I don't, the project team owns it. All I do is administer the dates that were provided. Now it's a bit of a mind shift, but it's worth considering. What that boils down to is defined and agreed schedule is your friend. Now, the reason I say that is because if you have a defined and agreed schedule, what that means is that everybody working on the project knows what they're doing, when they're doing it, and what they can expect from everybody else. So if you need a particular thing to do your job at a particular time, you can see all the people previous to you that are gonna do that. You can also see the people post you that are gonna make use of it. So as long as you can see that, that means that everything works relatively harmoniously. It also means that if someone wants to change something, if I turn up, for example, let's assume that you've told me something's gonna take four weeks and that's what the schedule says. What that means is then you have four weeks to deliver it. You have the space and the time to do it in the time you asked for. You can't be asked to do it in three, you, can't, you probably won't do it in five, but nobody's gonna turn up and say, I'd like you to do it quicker, please, because then you simply point at the schedule and say, that's the agreed schedule, talk to the project manager. So you can wrap yourself with a shield of a defined and agreed schedule if you want to get all flowery about it. And the project manager will be there to stand over it and make sure that you keep working to your part and nobody tries to divert you. So schedule examples, let's have a quick look at this. So this is a schedule, which is a plan with dates. And it's a plan with dates. It's got a list of things that need to be done and the order they need to be done with dates against them. That's not a particularly difficult project, to be perfectly honest. That's, a, that's what's called the basic example that I've picked off the web someplace. If you look at that, it's complicated. And the reason why it's complicated is because of lots of tasks. There's lots of things going on. It's worse than that because it's multiply parallel. And by that, I mean, there's lots of things going on at the same time. For those who are used to Gantt charts, this makes sense. For anybody who's not used to Gantt charts, basically every line is, an element, is a task to be done. The length of the line tells you the time it takes, the position on the Gantt chart tells you when it has to happen. So if we look at this particular month in terms of multiple parallelism, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 
eight things happening simultaneously. And that means it's quite difficult to keep an eye on what's going on and when it's going on. Dependencies galore. A dependency is something that has to happen before you can do what you do. And the way that's shown in there is these and shown in this chart is the various lines that connect all these together. So you can see this thing has to happen before this can happen, before this can happen, before this can happen, and so on and so forth. There, every single place where there are lines like that is a dependency. And the trouble with the dependency is it makes it almost impossible to see what's going on. So for example, this particular task takes this long and all these other things hang off it. If this task takes slightly longer, that means this one pushes out, which pushes that out, which pushes that out, and that ripples all the way through to the end. What that then means, if this pushes the date out, I as a project manager then have to work my way back up all these dependencies and try and find some place where I can get that time back in order to try and keep the dates the same. That means if I use this as a schedule to work to, I will spend more of my time updating it than actually using it. So it, this, this particular type of approach doesn't work for me as a pro project manager. What I prefer is something like this, which is what I call a realistic schedule. It's not realistic in that it's more real, it's just realistic in that you can realistically use it. It's a single page view of the project from start to finish. It shows you big stuff that happens, development, integration, verification, controls release or beta, depending on what you wanna call it. It shows you where you are at any given time. This is, an, this is a real life example from a program, I used, a project I used to run. It's got things that happen on a regular basis throughout. So you always know what's the next thing coming up that you're looking at. And it summarizes the big dates. Big dates are things that affect things outside the project. In an organization the size of HP, for example, we have dedicated manufacturing, supply chain, sales force, marketing. All those guys are actually dedicated departments in and of themselves and they have their own process that they run. So what happens is the development, when they're going to hand stuff over to sales, for example, there's a defined place where that has to happen. That's a key date. So we need to know what that key date is. This is what I call a realistic schedule. And the main key points about that is the realistic schedule tells you the project team, if you can do the things you said you do in the time that's left. It should be simple. As I've said, if you look at the spaghetti versus the single line, this is where we are. Less is absolutely more when it comes to showing schedules. It should be focused. There's no point in filling it with loads of stuff. You really need to look at it as what really matters. The things that people look at and go, ah, right, I understand. And it should summarize the key milestones. The key milestones are the ones that really, really matter. When's the development finished? When's the testing finished? When's the beta testing starting? When are we gonna release it to market? The big things that really, really matter. The point about a schedule, it has to be up to date. There's no point in having a, an updated plan. Stuff happens, things change, that's absolutely fine, but reflect that in the schedule. So whenever you look at the single pager, it tells you where you are now and what's left to do. And it always looks forward. That's the point about schedules. The reason for that is because it doesn't matter what's gone before, because the only way you can change that is if you have a time machine, which I don't, so I don't care. I'm always looking forward from now. And the question you're always asking when you look at a schedule is does the time scale still work? And if it doesn't adapt, never stay wedded to a schedule that doesn't work because then you've stopped being a project team and you've started being lemmings. Now, the key point about all this is the project team has an absolute right to demand a realistic schedule to work to. So when you work with a project team and you stitch together a realistic schedule, if you don't have a realistic schedule, don't start work. If you don't know it can be done, you're setting yourself up for failure from the start. So it doesn't matter how scary the project manager is. If you think something's going to take four weeks, you dig your heels in and take four, it takes four weeks. As long as you can make the point that it's going to take four weeks and a reasonable case for that, the project manager and everybody else has to accept that. If, for example, and it, not that I ever would, some project manager comes along and browbeats you into changing your four weeks that you know it's going to take to the three weeks that suits his plan, you can bet your boots you're not, he's not, the project manager is not going to be the one that's working evenings and weekends to make it fit into three weeks. You can also bet your boots that if it takes the four weeks that you said it would, but you agreed to three, you're the one that's to blame for that, not the project manager. So realistic schedule, you need to be able to see it and you need to agree that the dates on there are dates you agree to. Scope, scope I said is the list of stuff a customer will pay for. 
So the reason why that translates directly to money is that in order to deliver a certain amount of scope, it requires a certain amount of work. That requires a certain amount of people facilities. That results in a certain amount of cost. The point about a project is the business has to invest before the project delivers. So the business invests up front, then recoups the costs. So scope, the amount of stuff you're going to do directly translates to money. The death of many a project is what's called scope creep, which is expressed in different ways. But fundamentally, what that means is you start out with a list of 10 things, then someone adds an 11th or a 12th or a 15th, whatever. The point is, every time you add something in, every time the scope changes, that requires more work or more time. So the project, the nutty project we talked about earlier on, 12 people, million dollars takes a year. If it takes 18 months, it's going to cost one and a half million dollars. If that project was going to make $2 million, you started out with a million dollars of profit. Now you're down to half a million dollars of profit. So someone has to pay the extra in terms of scope creep. So it's either the business, because you get reduced profits, or in order to try and keep the profit the same, the business jacks up the prices. That doesn't necessarily mean you will sell the same amount. So you probably won't sell $2 million worth of stuff. The point about scope creep and the reason why it kills projects is because the project ultimately delivers less money than it was promised. So project managers, fundamentally, when it comes to scope, are there to ensure that projects deliver what was promised and only what was promised. So all scope is not created equal. The reason I say that is because some things matter more than others, just like life. If you look at scope, you can break it down into four basic elements. First of those is what's called the base scope, P0 in HP parlance. That's the thing the product absolutely has to have. It's got bodies assigned to it and it's got dates assigned to it. So analogy of project is to deliver a blue car, for example. You need some basic things to make it a car, such as engines, wheels, body, etc. So this base scope is also known as MVP, MSP, MMP. What that means is minimum viable product, minimal sellable product, or minimum marketable product. In other words, if you don't have the minimum set of stuff, you're not going to make any money. So that's the base scope. The opposite of base scope in the opposite corner is what's called the outplan scope or P0 in HP parlance. That's the stuff the product will not have. Now, intuitively, you think that the things it won't have are the opposite of the things that it will, but that's not quite true because if this is the base scope, which is five or six things, then the things it doesn't have could be a list of a million things. That's not really workable. So the reason why the outplan scope is as important as the base scope is because it clarifies what's going to be delivered by the project. So for example, if the project is to deliver a blue car, but your scope says, I'm going to deliver a car, you turn up with a car, a blue car, the sales guy takes one look at it and says, I thought it was going to be red. You didn't say you wouldn't, therefore you said you would. So telling everybody involved what it's not is as important as telling what it is. And it's the big stuff that matters. Like it's going to have, not going to have a turbo, for example, to quote the car analogy. In between base and out plan is what's called working scope. Working scope is the products, the things the product should have. And the point about working scope, it is also has bodies allocated, it has dates on the schedule. And that's the sort of thing that typically tend to be more functional elements. So for example, an automatic gearbox would be P1 because if you can't deliver the automatic, you deliver it with a manual, it's still a car. It still does what it's supposed to do. Similarly, things like air conditioning. A car without an air conditioning is just a less comfortable car but it's still a car. The reason why it's defined in this way is because P0, the base scope, has to be delivered. Otherwise, you don't launch the product. The P1 scope, you can lose some or all of these and still deliver the base scope. So you still make the money that's required. Then we have aspirational scope, the final four in the final quadrant. What aspirational scope is the stuff the product might have should time allow. So when the project starts, aspirational scope is not resourced, it doesn't have bodies against it, and it doesn't have dates on the plan. It doesn't have dates on the schedule that are associated with it. And that could be stuff, for example, in the car analogy, P1 is air conditioning. If you deliver the air conditioning, you might consider driving dual zone air conditioning, so your passenger and your driver are both equally comfortable. The point about aspirational scope is it doesn't go in to the project scope unless you've delivered your P0 and your P1. This is my personal favorite slide. You can look it up on the internet. Clarity is all. 
Now, the reason why this is my favorite slide is not because it's extremely funny, is because anybody who's ever worked on a project, anybody on this call who's ever worked on a project can point to any one of these beans and give an anecdote about how they saw that happen. So that's why it's, it's reality delivered with humor, which I particularly like. So clarity matters. So if clarity matters and scope has to be absolutely defined, is it set in stone? The answer to that is no, because stuff happens, things change. To quote one of my countrymen, the best laid plans of mice and men aft gang awry. So with the best will in the world, you can start off delivering your project and something will change. So projects need to be flexible to accommodate change. And when I say things will change, that can either come from within the project, something takes longer, you know, technology doesn't work or whatever. So you have to be flexible to deal with that, or it can be external change. Good example, if you want to use the blue car analogy again, is the project is there to deliver blue cars and sell them. If all the competitors turn up six months before we deliver and all sell blue cars, that means it saturates the market for blue cars, which means by the time our project completes, nobody's going to buy a blue car because everybody's already got one. So the project doesn't then continue. It has to be able to deal with the change to that. Now, the point is all change comes with a level of risk. Risk is something that engineers, bless them, are not very good at because by and large engineers are natural optimists. But the point about project managers is we're the complete opposite. So anytime you change something, it comes with a level of risk. Again, the naughty analogy, you were gonna deliver a blue car. Halfway through the project, you're now gonna deliver a red car. What that means is instead of the thousand gallons of blue paint that you have in a warehouse that you bought early, now you have to short in a short period of time, source a thousand gallons of red paint instead. You might not be able to do that. You may have to pay more. All that is risk. So projects, change will happen. It's inevitable. It could be good, but it is inevitable. It comes with a level of risk. So what that means is that before a change gets made, the impact implications of that change have to be assessed. And that process is called change control. And the point that, again, another place where developers and project managers often fall out is if you as a developer want to make a change for all manner of good reasons, you have to make the case for why that change has to be made. And you have to prove the benefits of making that change outweigh the costs because there will be risk, there will be implications. And the flip side of that is unless you've got robust change control, the answer is total chaos. So if we look at that from a sort of, again, nutty perspective, we talked before about a lot of project team of 12 people. Let's assume you've got 12 software engineers all working on their particular pieces of, uh, pieces of a piece of software. Number one developer realizes that with a single line change, he can make his particular piece go twice as fast or take half the resources or make a major technological breakthrough with a single line change. So he makes it because he's driven by technology. He's driven by a technical guy. Of course, he makes the change because it's, it's all to the good. So his piece of the software now works perfectly and a lot better. Trouble is, software developers two through seven were relying on his project software working in a particular way. So now their stuff stops working. Now, being human beings, they assume what they've done is they've broken it somehow. So they start debugging and finding out why. Developers two through six spot the fact that it was actually caused by a change that number one made. So they stop dead because there's nothing they can do until it's either someone tells them what to do about it or he put the number one puts it back. Trouble is, number seven realizes number one has made a change, but rather than stop dead because he wants to show that he's still making progress, he or she is still making progress, they adapt their particular piece of the software to work with number one. So now number one works, number seven works, two through six are dead in the water. Now the problem is, eight through 12 also expected number seven's software to work in a particular way, and he's just changed it, which means that eight through 12 are now dead in the water because their software suddenly stops working. Human nature, they think it's their fault, they start debugging, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the point is, unless you've got robust change control, there's chaos. Change control is your friend because it prevents that happening. In the situation we've just described, for example, two through seven are protected by the fact that number one can't make a change unless he makes the case to the project for why the change should take place and what the implications are before the change gets made. Two through seven get a good chance to look at that and say, yeah, it's a really good change, but it breaks everything else, so don't make it. So it defends everybody in the chain throughout this stuff. So change control is your friend. It also, as with the, I talked about with the schedule, if someone wants you to change, typically, God bless them, senior managers will turn up at your desk and say, if you do it this way, it'll be so much better. 
And whilst that may be true, you're back in the situation of uncontrolled change. What you can do as a developer, because otherwise you have my senior manager standing over you asking you to make a change. Now you can either live with the stress of that, telling the senior manager no, or you can simply point out the change control process and say, this is what I've agreed to do. If you want a change made, you have to go through the change control process. That then becomes my problem to deal with your senior manager, not yours. So change control is absolutely your friend. Change is inevitable, change control, control change is a good thing. Next aspect, the fourth thing that I care about is quality. Now I will bet, before we get there, so quality equals money, why is that? We've already said the projects don't get complete until the customer agrees and pays you the money for the things you said you would deliver. So if the product doesn't do what you said it would, the customer's not gonna pay you for it. And that breaks business rule number one, which is make money. If it doesn't keep on doing what it said it would, it, the customer's not gonna buy another one. So that breaks business rule number two, which is keep on making money. And it's a fundamental truth that businesses live or die by the quality of the things they produce. I know that sounds blindingly obvious, but it's worth stating the fact. Once you get a reputation for poor quality, you're dead as a business. People don't keep on, don't buy your stuff anymore. If I were to ask everybody on this call for a definition of quality, I guarantee I'd get 24 different answers and I'd probably get multiple answers from the same people. And the reason for that is because there is no one quality model. There are multiple models of quality and they're all valid and they're all equally valid and invalid depending on what you're trying to do. Quality models really boil down to what it is, what it is you're trying to measure. This slide I picked up 27 years ago when I was doing my induction training from an NHP and I'm still using it even now. So that shows it's got a certain amount of validity. So there are typically five models of quality and this is the four of them, which I'll just describe for you now. This time I'm gonna use the iPhone as an example rather than the blue car, simply because it's actually slightly better. The first approach is transcendent, which is based on what they call innate excellence. The look, the feel, the smell, there's something that you can't quite put your finger on, but you know it's a quality product just by looking at it. So the iPhone and by that definition, you'd argue is a quality product because people look at it and go, oh, I've got to have one of these. It's a quality product and because Apple's marketing is absolutely excellent. But if you ask people to say specifically state what it is that makes the quality product, you get a whole range of answers, all of them pretty much subjective. Second model is manufacturing base, which is freedom from errors. How many of them drop off the end of the line and work when you take them out of the box? Now the iPhone in that context is probably a quality product simply because it costs a lot to make, costs a lot to rework. So you can guarantee that you're gonna try and get a, a yield that's very, very high as it drops off the manufacturing line. Conversely, if you look at the gas Samsung Galaxy when it came out that nice curvy screen, that was a rubbish product when it first launched because the, scheme, the screens kept breaking. They were very difficult to manufacture. So from a manufacturing based quality model, it was a very bad, poor, poor product. They've fixed that since, they can now churn them out. It's a much better quality product than it was. Next approach is product base. So what's its feature set? How many bells and whistles? What's the things it does? What does it come bundled with? iPhone, yeah, probably a quality phone, a you know, quality product in that respect, but there are better phones out there in that context. There's phones that have got better features, faster, bigger, you name it, they've got it. So from that perspective, the iPhone is probably a quality product, but there's probably better quality products out there by the same, by that measure. Fourth of the current ones is value-based, which is the cost and the price. How much does it make cost? How much does it cost to produce? What do you get when you sell it? Now the iPhone is probably a quality product by that because it sells for an awful lot of money. That's why Apple got as big as they did. If you're after a phone that basically does phone calls and does your socials and you don't want to spend thousands of pounds on it, then the iPhone is not a quality product from your perspective. You're better off an OEM one or a slightly cheaper one that still does the job for a lower price. The point about all of these is they're very either very specific, such as the manufacturing based, or they're very wide ranging and subjective, such as the transcendent model. So from my personal perspective as a project manager, I can't actually use any of these. So the one I've found works best is what I call the user, what's called the user based model, which basically looks at from a customer's perspective, is the thing that you've produced fit for the purpose it was produced? Now, for those of you who remember Ron Seal in the 90s, they made a 15 year, very successful advertising approach based on Ron Seal does exactly what it says on the tin. 
which is says it's fit for purpose. That's the model they used and very successfully. The reason why from a project management perspective, I like this one and why I use it above all else is because it's customer focused. If it's fit for purpose, the customer is going to pay you. Therefore, I have done my job. I've achieved it. It's objective and it's measurable. If, for example, the scope, which I referred to before, is the list of things a customer will pay for, if you've got a list of 10 things and you deliver 10 of them, that's 100% quality. If you deliver nine of the 10, that's 90% quality. That's measurable. It's also objective. You can't have the discussion that you've met the spirit of requirement number eight, but not quite the letter. You either delivered it or you didn't. That makes it objective and makes it very easy to use. So I recommend this particular set of model. If you're going to do quality, talk about it in the context of fit for purpose. So in the ideal world, I look at money, I look at time, I look at scope and at quality. We have a plan, we have to create a plan, create a schedule from it, we deliver all is well. Unfortunately, the real world is not like that. So there's always risk. So what we're going to look at now in this particular section is what's called risk management. One of the objectives when we set this out was terminology. How do we describe things in a way that we, for you as the project team and me as the project manager, we're actually talking about the same things. So three things in risk management terminology are worries, risks, and issues. So what's a worry? A worry is something that's in the future. Its potential hasn't happened yet. It's non-specific. So you can't actually write it down in a few words and say that's what it is, and you've got no action plan for it. So I could worry I get ill tomorrow, for example. I can have an action plan for that, but until I have an action plan, it remains as a worry. What's a risk? Risk is different from worry because a risk is specific. You can write down exactly what it is you're worried about. It's also potential because it's in the future and so it hasn't happened yet. The big difference between a risk and a worry is a risk is something you can do something about, either before it happens or when it happens. You have a plan. If you want a good rule of life, actually, is turn worries into risks because it's a lot less stressful. Worry you have no control over that causes stress, a risk you have a feeling of control and agency that drops the stress massively. So whether it's your personal life or your professional life, turn worries into risks. The other thing is an issue. What's an issue? An issue is a problem that has to be dealt with now. So something has gone wrong, you've got to deal with it. So from a risk management point of view, my personal view for a project manager, I manage risks, not worries. I'm not interested in worries. I could worry that an asteroid will strike the Earth tomorrow and wipe out all life. There's nothing I can do about that. It's a worry, but it's not of relevance to me as a project manager. I only manage risks. Another point about risks is their potential. They could happen. They're in the future, but they must be managed to stop them going wrong and stop them becoming issues. So you take the pin out of the grenade. You can put the pin back in again, and that stops it becoming an issue. Or you can let it go. Not recommended. How do you turn worries into risks? You use what's called the risk management mantra. And this is something I pinched off an engineer many years ago. What the risk management mantra does is state things in a particular way. So for example, if I were to work with software engineers on my project and I say, what are the risks to this project? The software engineers will say hardware. Hardware engineers will say software. That doesn't actually help me as a project manager because it doesn't give me anything to work with. So I always ask people to express things using the risk management mantra. So when you express a risk, express it in this way. There is a risk that this bad thing will happen, so we will take action. The actions you can take in terms of risk management, there's four of them, four basic actions. First one is called avoid. We reduce the chances of the bad thing happening. So it can still happen, but you've reduced the chances. Mitigate, we reduce the impact. So if the bad thing happens, it's not as bad as the impact, the damage that it does is less than it would have been. Transfer, make it somebody else's problem. That sounds kind of counterintuitive, but the entire insurance, insurance industry is based on the transfer of, transference of risk. So for example, we all insure our cars because if we crash our car, we can't, we can't necessarily afford the repairs that result from that. So you basically pay an insurance company 200 quid or whatever, and they will then cover the costs of the repair to your car. The insurance company itself transfers the risk because it then charges 10 people or 100 people, 200 quid. On the basis that only a few of you are going to crash your cars at any given time, so they might have enough money to be able to do that. That's transference. All of the above come with costs. You've got to do something about these, so they come with some sort of cost. 
acceptance is the view that yes, the bad thing might happen, so what? There's nothing we can do about it or there's nothing we choose to do about it, so we'll just live with it. To give you a naughty example of this, and it's not designed to insult your intelligence, it's just trying to put this in context. If I'm going to the station tomorrow to catch a train to some important meeting with the BCS in London as to talk about this talk I've just given, there's a risk that when I walk to the station, it might rain and I will get wet. It's the risk management mantra to express it in that way. The four options of actions available to me are, I avoid it. So if it's raining, I stay inside. That means I don't get wet, but I'll probably miss my train. Then I'll have to get a later train. I'll probably have to pay for another ticket, etc., etc. It comes with consequences. I could mitigate it by carrying an umbrella. So I still leave the house. I put the umbrella up. It means my feet get wet, but I still catch my train. That means I have to buy an umbrella if I haven't already got one, and I have to carry the umbrella around all day. So again, there are consequences. There are costs of the action that I'm taking. I could transfer the risk. I could get a taxi. That way the taxi driver's car gets wet, but I don't, and I catch my train. But I've got to pay for the taxi, so cost associated. If I look at the actions I could take, be it avoid, mitigate, transfer, or some combination of all of those, I don't have an umbrella, I can't buy one in time, I'm too mean to pay for a taxi, but I've got to catch that train, then I just live with the fact that if it rains, I get wet, but the rain never killed anyone. But on the flip side, it might not rain. That's the point about risk, it's potential. If you're gonna manage risk, you have to be specific what it is you're trying to, what the risk is going to be and what action you're gonna take and be prepared. Very Boy Scout, I know, but it's basically look ahead. One of the differences between project managers and engineers, as I've already mentioned, is that project managers tend to look on the worst, whereas engineers are natural optimists. Software developers, particular case in point, you issue a command, that command will complete, you go on to the next command. It helps if you actually take a more pessimistic view of the universe. I'm going to quickly go through the, run through this slide. I've talked about managing risk. How do you do that in practice? How do I do that in practice? Basically, I make a meaningful list of risks called a risk log. The point about a risk log is it's not 57 pages of worries because that doesn't actually help me do anything. It's only a list of the things I can do something about because they're the ones that will actually... <laughs> I have agency over those. If I can't do anything about it, there's no point in worrying about it. There's no point in putting it on my risk log because it's just cluttering things up. Again, less is more. It's the top five, 10, whatever number that you can deal with, the top 10 concerns that would wake me up screaming at four in the morning if it were to happen. The point about risks is risks are always in the future. So what you can do with each and every risk is decide on its sell-by date, the date by which it comes, comes, comes to pass. Once the date's passed, the risk is gone. So in the example I've just given of where I'm walking to the station, if I make it to the station and it hasn't rained, the risk is gone because I'm not going to get wet because I'm in the station. So once the date's passed, you can cross it off the list and only worry about the list, the risks that remain. Good rule of life is carry out, avoid, mitigate transfer actions as soon as you can. The reason for that is because if you deal with the known risks, that leaves you more time to deal with the ones you didn't see coming. With the best will in the world, when you manage risk, there's always something that comes up and bites you in the proverbial. It's the one you didn't see. And then, like everything else the project managers do, in his regular review, you review the risk log every week because if the sell-by date's gone, whew, thank you. If the upcoming risk looks like it's going to become an issue, then get your retaliation in first. Deal with it before it becomes a problem. Procrastination in this context of risk management is not your friend. The longer you leave it, the less time you have to deal with it, the more difficult it's going to be and the less likely you are to be successful in dealing with it. And if you hadn't already realized that project managers are professional pessimists. Okay, one of the things I talked about when I first kicked this off was tips and tricks for how to be successful in a project. So if you remember a project team, what are the things that are expected of you or what would I as a project manager expect of you? So if you're working on one of my projects, one of the things I expect of everybody is to respect the laws of project management. And there's only one law and that's Murphy's law. For those not familiar with Murphy's law, if it can go wrong, it will. It's expressed in various different ways. And to the software and hardware engineers amongst you, if you change it, you will break it. That is a given or you'll break something else, as we talked about the example before. The other key points about Murphy's Law is left to themselves, things will go from bad to worse. Procrastination, again, is not your friend. And things always get worse under pressure. You can always see that in any project, when you're coming up towards a deadline and something's not quite right, 
that's when mistakes get made because people rush to get things done. They've got senior managers standing over them saying, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Things get worse under pressure. So the reason why you look at things pessimistically is you avoid getting put in that position in the first place because you manage the risk further back. So in essence, if you want to deal with Murphy's Law, you always hope for the best because we're all optimists, that's what we do, but you plan for the worst and you act early. Don't let things fester. If it's bad, deal with it. Other thing I expect from our projects, communication. You have to report the status of your work regularly and widely. Now, we're all British, we're all quite you know, reserved. We don't like to sort of blow our own trumpets. The point about this is that if you look at it from a Zen perspective, a tree falls in the forest and nobody's there to hear it, does it make any noise? The project manager flavor of that is if work has been done and nobody knows about it, has anything actually been achieved? So, and the reason why that's also compounded is because nature abhors a vacuum. People will make stuff up. And that results in what's called FUD, technical term, for fear, uncertainty, and doubt. If I report my project status, for example, monthly, on the first, first day of every month, I report the status on the first of the month, I say, all is well, it's going just fine, thank you. Everybody goes, terrific, well done job, well done project team, good job. A week later, it's a week since the status was reported, people are saying, it's all right, it's probably fine, haven't heard anything for a week, but it's probably okay. When you get to the end of the second week, people are thinking, I haven't heard anything for two weeks. Uh, hmm. I wonder if it's all right. I wonder if things are going wrong and they're just not telling me. Mm, it's probably okay. End of the third week, I haven't heard anything yet. It's probably gone wrong. It's almost certainly gone wrong. Something is definitely happening because I'm not being told. There's something definitely gone wrong. You get to the end of the fourth week, but this time people are running around doing chicken licking. The sky is falling. The project's, people think the project is in flames. The business is going down the swanee. We're all going to lose our jobs. It's the end of Western civilization. First of the next month, I turn up and say, project's all fine. Thank you. Everybody goes, ah, and then it repeats. So the point about status is you have to report it regularly weekly, ideally, even when things are going fine, just to reassure people that that's happening. If you're a member of a project team, so you're reporting your status regularly, summarize it. So what I'm not interested in when I say, how's it going? Give me your status. You can say, here's a half page narrative that explains how clever I've been and all the good stuff I've delivered. That's great for you. From my perspective, not so good because I've got 50 people in my project team. I now have a 25 page list of stuff I have to sift through to identify the narrative, to identify what's good, what's bad, and how I've then got to distill that into the single page that I need to feed back into the business. So I always request people in my project team to summarize with flags, red, yellow, green. That's also known as RAG, red, amber, green, or traffic lights. And it means pretty much well, what you'd expect. Green means it's fine or rather in the classical sense, green means it's fine, yellow means it's broken. And in the classical use of this, red means it's more broken. I have two problems with this particular approach of fine, broken, and more broken. What's more broken than broken? What's redder than red? Is it crimson? Is it black? So there's always room for things to get worse. And the second thing is to do with human nature. People don't like giving bad news. And I, that's perfectly understandable because basically if you're giving the bad news that makes you the messenger and everybody knows what happens to them it's also there's a certain amount of guilt i've found in project teams where people are reluctant to report things gone bad because they feel some sort of sense of personal responsibility so for example if something has gone wrong and you wave a red flag to the project there's an expectation that everybody else will go oh, he waves the flag of shame it's his fault that it went wrong that's not true it didn't necessarily be true it might be but generally it's not so the way I tend to use red, yellow, green is a particular, particular spin I put on it. And this is what I expect in my project teams, which is that green flag means it's fine or it's on track to be fine. The green part, if you're waving green flag at me, that's your flag, it stays with you. Yellow flag means something's broken, something's gone wrong, but I'm handling it, thanks. So the red, the yellow flag stays with you. You're waving a flag to me to let me know in advance that something's gone wrong, but you've got it handled. You don't need my help. The red flag means that something has gone wrong and you can't fix it. Now that could be, for example, if you're a software guy and you're expecting hardware to be delivered for your software to be tested on and the software and the hardware doesn't turn up, there's not much you can do about that. So what you do is you wave a red flag to go, I've tried, but I can't fix this. 
The point about a red flag in this context is the red flag now belongs to me. You've handed the responsibility for fixing it to me. It's no longer your problem. And that means that people are more likely to wave red flags sooner rather than later because they can hand off the problem because that also works with human nature, which is, whoa, it's yours. Clear, someone else's problem. The point about a red flag is once I have the red flag, then I can go and talk to the supplier to find out why the hardware hasn't been delivered. They say it's because they haven't been paid. I can then go to finance and go, excuse me, I need the hardware. Finance say, uh, director X has said, we're not going to pay the bills for 90 days instead of 60. Some reason like that. I can't fix that. So I then wave the red flag at the appropriate director. That becomes their problem. So red flags move their way up the organization until they find the person who can fix it. So green, basically again, in this context, it's much more likely that people wear that red flag early. That gives everybody more time to fix it. I find this a far more workable way of doing it. In essence, what I'm trying to say here is either you manage the news or the news manages you. If you control the narrative, you can explain it's all fine or it's not fine, but I've got it handled. This is the help that I need. That gives you agency. It takes the stress out of what you're doing. If you don't do that, if you don't communicate, if you don't communicate clearly, you don't summarize, the news will manage you because I'll be turning up at your desk to ask you what's going on or some senior management will be offering you assistance to solve your problem, whether you need it or not. So if you want to be a successful manager of my project team, be a safe pair of hands. All I ever ask is that you do what you said you do when you said you'd do it. I don't expect you to run through walls. I don't expect you to work evenings and weekends because you're no use to me broken. It's not because I'm kind of altruistic. The whole point is the project relies on each and every member of the project team doing what they said they'd do when they said they'd do it. Another key thing about developers, bless you, you always learn to invent the, the better mouse trap. But the point is, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If it's working, leave it alone. Because if you try and change it, that incurs risk. We've already talked to death about why risk is a bad thing. Similarly, stick to the tried and trusted approaches. There's always a better way of doing things. That's a given. However, if the way you're doing it right now is good enough, leave it alone. It ain't broke. Because if you do something new, the reason it's tried and trusted is because it's been done before and it's proven to work. If you do something new that's unknown, introduces risk, we don't like risk. Communicate. As I've said, give regular summarized updates. And that applies especially when things are going fine. I don't know it's fine unless you tell me I'm not a mind reader. And I don't want to have to come and ask you. I don't want to have to come and extract status out of you. And the reason for that is quite simple. If, for example, you say, or you're a developer and you say, I haven't told you, but it only costs you five minutes to come along and ask me. That's true for you, it's five minutes. If there are 50 people in the project team, that means I've now got to spend four hours walking around talking to each of those guys just to find that everything's fine. Whereas if you, all 50 members summarize, it's fine in a two and two, two line email that cost me five minutes and I can spend the other three hours, 55 minutes doing far more interesting things and far more valuable things for the project. So don't make me come and ask. We've talked about risk management. In essence, that's no surprises. And basically if it's gone wrong, tell me sooner rather than later. And even if you think it's gonna go wrong, tell me even sooner. Because if you tell me it's going to go wrong, it has gone wrong, that allows me more time to provide you the help that you need. Because that's what project managers are there to do. They're there to keep things moving along. Almost everything you'd be happy to know. This is the summary slide. This is the project manager view of the world. We've talked about money and how project managers are coin operated because of their projects that are business investment. We've talked about time, schedules, plans. We've talked about scope and quality. We've talked about risk and particularly about Murphy's Law. If you learn nothing else from this session, remember Murphy's Law. Keep it firmly in mind. And we've talked about communication. Projects live or die by the quality of the communications within the project itself, so everybody knows what's going on, and the communication to the wider world, so everybody knows how the project is doing. I'll leave it there. Sorry, I was on mute. Every, every Zoom call has to have someone saying, sorry, I was on mute. So here we are. <laughs> um, so thanks very much for that, Pete. Um, yeah, that, that was, even though I've almost certainly seen this material before, and even though I've um, almost certainly heard you say all these things to me before, um, that was really interesting and valuable. Thank you for that. Um, do, we, we have got a few minutes, not very many, but we have got a few minutes. So if you have some questions, um, please do add them into the chat.
I've certainly got a couple. Um, the first one is almost a, a comedy one, but not quite. So the picture, I'm not sure if you can go back to the picture with the swings, if that's an easy thing. So I used something really quite similar as a, uh, a kind of game for defining requirements with a, a group from a school in Bristol, mm -hmm. where um, it was a kind of adversarial game. So uh, an asymmetric adversarial game. We said, well, you, team A, you define a requirement. Team B, your, your next move is to uh, describe an implementation of that, that that does reflect what they said, but that does not reflect what they meant. So yeah, I'm going to define a function. I'm going to write some software to define a function. It should return zero if all the inputs are zero. To which the answer is, well, it returns zero all the time. Okay, no, I didn't mean that. I meant something else, which is went true. <laughs> and that, and this feels very similar. Mm. And uh, I, I kind of want to, to use this image now that we're seeing in a, in a new version of that game. And I'm not quite sure how to do that, but I, I'm mm. going to find a way. But it's that, I think the key there is that the, it's the communication. It's that, it's that shared understanding, that common understanding that as the years go on is, is more clear to me that, that is exactly massively important. Right. And as I say, anybody who's worked on projects can point to any one of these and give a humorous anecdote about how they were bitten by it at some point in the past. It is reality, even though it's very, very funny. My particular favorite, by the way, is the ice wing. I do like that. I think that's very is the, Hang on, which one is that? Sorry. Down here. Oh, the ice wing down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Well, it's nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's a similar one that I've seen on LinkedIn, I think, where you have a, a, queue, uh, a queue of people, one behind the other, and each one is drawing an image on the back of the one in front, and then yes. that gets translated. I mean, ultimately, it, it sounds like Chinese whisper or something. It's that communication. Communication is key. Yes. Uh, I see. And you said the one takeaway would be Murphy's Law. Um, I think the one takeaway for me I, would be communication. Communication is key. And, and that, mm -hmm. that shared understanding that, I mean, meeting of minds, I guess, is the expression I would use for that. But if we, if we if we all agree and if we know that we agree then we're all good and that's part of the reason why one of the ways i phrased this was at least agree on the terminology so when i say plan and you say what do, what do you hear and when you say schedule what do i hear at least if we're talking because schedule and plans tend to be used interchangeably they're yeah. not and if you do use them interchangeably at least all manner of confusion so agree on what the terminology means yeah, totally. Uh, and I had a, a spin-off question. I'm going to vamp a little bit because I had a spin-off question there that I forgot. Um, so this is this is uh, almost rhetorical. Why would we deliver P2? Why would, why would we deliver aspirational stuff? Why would we, in what, I mean, I'm, and this is again rhetorical, what, why would we do that when we could just move the developers who might be doing it onto something else more valuable? There's two reasons. One is because you might sell more product as a consequence. The second is actually largely political. P2 tends to be the dumping ground of things that we realistically know we cannot do, but at least we've admitted the fact that we might. So that tends to damp down the enthusiasm of people like sales and marketing, no disrespect to them. If you ask a sales guy what he wants or sales or marketing guys what they want in a car, you want something that's a thousand miles an hour and runs on water. So you agree on something that'll do 500 miles an hour and run on petrol or whatever. The point is you leave the thousand miles an hour as an aspirational, even though you know realistically it's never going to happen. So it damps down the, it's kind of not making it P0, which tends to be a little bit contentious in that people are quite upset when you tell them you can't have something. But if you tell them they might be able to do something, then you may well be able to deliver it. But realistically, the chances are anybody who's got a lot of P2s they're going to deliver hasn't done their scheduling right. And they haven't done the resourcing right. You're quite right. You deliver the P0, the P0s and the P1s then you move people onto the next project. That's the reality. So aspirational is exactly that and as often as not, doesn't get delivered. So do you use that as a, as a metric on yourself then for this kind of planning? So if we delivered like a load of P2s, do, do you have a secret chat with yourself and say, mm, I did something wrong there? Nope. I yeah. tend to just leave it there as something that's exactly that, it's aspirational. Okay. I measure myself strictly by the P0s and the P1s. Okay, thanks. Um, and now, you had an image again. This is a comedy one. Uh, there's you had an image of a conductor with an orchestra. Yes. Now I remember something. I think from this week on, maybe it might have been an AI orchestra. It was, there was something. There was something going on this week where there was an orchestra with no conductor, hmm. and there was a lot of chat about. Well, does the conductor add value? So extending the metaphor to breaking points between the program manager, the project manager, and the conductor. 
does the project manager add value? The project manager really only adds value when things go wrong. If everything ran, I mean, if everything happened in the order it had to happen and it all dropped out at the end, that's not actually a project, that's a process. That's a manufacturing line because it's not doing something new. The reason why the project manager there is because what you're trying to do with the project hasn't been done before or some aspect of it hasn't been done before. The value of a project manager is not when it's going well, it's when the smelly stuff impacts the air conditioning and the project manager is there to get it back on track, to either avoid that happening in the first place or to deal with it when it does. And that takes the worry off the people. For example, the programmers are all happily hacking code, that's what they do. What they don't want to be worrying about, for example, is whether or not the, as I mentioned before, the hardware is going to turn up on time. Someone else needs to worry about that. The guys buying the hardware will buy the hardware and have it delivered. But if it turns up late, that's not actually their problem because they've bought the hardware and had it delivered. So the project manager sits in the overview of making sure that the hardware arrives when it should and if it does accordingly. So really project managers are there for when it goes wrong. It's a bit like driverless cars. You know, a car will drive along quite happily, but you need a driver in it just in case something comes up that driverless AI can't deal with. Think of project managers as the, the guy behind the wheel, just in case. Yeah, well, that fits in nicely from a comment that we, hear, <clears throat> that we have here from one of, the, one of the audience. The best PMs are the ones you don't think are doing anything. When a PM is flapping around, it's always bad news. Uh, exactly I guess there's, right. there's a number of ways to interpret that. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that leads on to my, to my final question, which is that as a, as a contributor, as a non-project uh, manager, can I have a realistic aim that I never see you or is it always going to be the case that you're, you're going to chase me for something? Uh, what, should, should my goal be the project manager actually never comes to see me because, because of what I'm doing? Am I being preemptive enough that you never see me? Or is that, is that an unattainable goal? It's largely unattainable, but it's a desirable goal. I remember someone commenting before that his manager only had time to worry about three. So his objective in life was always to be the fourth thing on his manager's list because that way it never came to his attention. If everything's going swimmingly, as I say, you won't even know the program, the project manager's there because there is no need for them. So if I'm turning up at your desk, being all reasonable about it, there's a reason for that. Either I don't know what's going on because you're not communicating, communicating clearly or something's coming down the line that you need to know about now. So by and large, if you manage, as I said, be a safe pair of hands. If you do what you said you'd do, when you said you'd do it, and you tell me that all is well or that you're dealing with any problems that come up, and it's still working to the schedule, you will never see me. I'll get people together to talk about them en masse just to make sure everybody's on the same page, but I have no reason to visit you. Why would I? Well, yeah, yeah, I'm, I certainly remember being oh, yes. visited. <laughs> <laughs> it's, been, it's, it's been a while. I'm, I'm looking down at my notes. I'm not, I'm not avoiding eye contact. I'm <laughs> just looking down at my notes. Yeah, um, was have that twitch. <laughs> Uh, and I have got one, this is a properly final one now. Uh, as a, Again, as a software developer, for example, how should I communicate to you um, when we're doing some planning? I don't know how long this will take. I can't estimate this. Estimating is hard. How can I communicate? What's my best way of communicating to you? I don't know how long it takes. Tell me that, then we'll have a discussion. And as often as not, my question is, how long did it take you last time? How long did something like this take you the last time you did it? If you didn't do it, Oh, but Fred in the corner, has he done it? How long did it take him? There's always precedent. Nothing is ever completely new. And then if you say probably about four weeks, but 50% of it's different, all you do is hand me the four weeks and I will build in the extra two weeks. I suspect it will take. But the reason you leave that to me is because if everybody says four weeks, probably six, you end up with everybody padding. And then what you end up with is an unrealistic schedule, an unreasonable schedule. Yeah. So by and large, if you don't know, say you don't know. There's no shame in saying you don't know. You know it's, it's the old comment about, you know, if you, you know, it's better to keep your mouth shut, basically, and, and not real, make people realize you're a fool. If you yeah. tell me you don't know, we can work together to figure something out. If you give me a number you know to be wrong, just because you think I need a number, you're the one that's going to suffer for that, not me, because you'll be the one that's expected to meet it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so there's one comment here, also the PMs you can pass a red flag to and then forget it in the knowledge that PM will solve to allow you to deal with the red flags. I, I, th I think what that's saying is uh, th these are good PMs. I think the best PMs are the ones where you can, uh, so as a PM, you want to be able to try, you want the, the developers to be a, a safe pair of hands 
I guess the, the converse is also true. The developers want you to be a safe pair of hands. Absolutely. And also on the communication front, if I can fix the problem or get the problem fixed for you, I'll come back and tell you it's fixed. I will communicate back the other way. Yeah. I, I, I'm seeing again that, that communication is key. Yeah, and I'm a, a big, big fan. As the years have gone on, I've become an even bigger fan of communication, of communication being key. Um, we, we've run slightly over. I don't want to go too over because I, I kind of think that the Zoom thing will end surprisingly if we go too far over. But thanks to everybody. Thanks in particular to Pete for giving the talk. I think it's been really useful and, and really uh, interesting. Um, so thanks to everyone who's attended as well. I hope it was useful for you. Um, we, we don't have a, a topic for next month. We are going to try and line something up. Our plan will be uh, final Thursday of the month. In the next couple of months, I imagine we will be doing these in the real. So I look forward to that. We'll be looking for some venues. HPE is a little bit out of the way. So we're going to be, uh, uh, I'm talking to you. You know who you are. I'm looking for a, a venue here. There's someone on the call who might be able to offer us a venue. So perhaps somewhere in town in Bristol or Bath would be handy for physical ones. Probably a couple of months away, but, but not much more than that, I would imagine. Um, so thanks all. I'll end it now. And I will let people know in the next couple of days um, what our plan is for the next couple of talks. So thanks again. And thanks again to Pete for giving us the talk. Pleasure. Thank you, Dave.